I want to thank Jesus for the plan of salvation. Just to say, Lord, I love you, for you understand. I want to be there on that great judgment morning to touch all the nail prints in his feet and his hands. One morning at daybreak, all crowd slowly gathered. They were walking my Lord up, oh Calvary's hill. So sad was the scene there, the birds hushed their singing. Like a lamb he was humble to his Father's own will. His plan of salvation still saves a lost sinner who comes to the Savior to do His good will. He'll cleanse every sin stain in baptism's waters and give us His Spirit as His Father has willed. I want to thank Jesus for the plan of salvation just to say, Lord, I love you, for you understand. I want to be there on that great judgment morning to hear his voice call me into heaven's fair land. The Lord's Supper is a very important element in the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is a memorial to his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And as a memorial feast, the Lord's Supper causes us to look back to what Jesus has done for us, that he died for our sins, according to the scripture, and also that he rose from the dead on the third day. And it's also a reason for self-examination on our part. And then also the Lord's Supper anticipates the Lord's return. And so the Lord's Supper encourages us to look back. It encourages us to look at the present, and it also encourages us to look to the future. Uh, in the early church, there was a meal that we often refer to as the Agape Feast. And these meals were similar to what we commonly call dinners on the ground in the church today although we don't usually spread our meals out uh, on the ground or even outside any longer. Uh, these meals were often held when the church gathered and would precede the Lord's Supper. Uh, the church at Corinth was having difficulties with their attitudes regarding these meals, and they also were allowing these things to affect their partaking of the Lord's Supper, and it had even corrupted the Lord's Supper at that time. The Lord's Supper was never a common meal, and it was not to be used for feeding the physical appetite, but rather the Lord's Supper is a memorial feast that has a spiritual significance, and Paul makes this very clear here in 1 Corinthians 11. We're going to be studying uh, verse uh, 17 down through the end of the chapter, verse 34. But first, let's read from 1 Corinthians 11. 17 through 22. Now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? 
Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. The reference uh, to coming together is for the formal worship assembly of the church. Uh, Paul had already talked earlier in the book about the divisions and factions in the church at Corinth, and it appears that these divisions were also affecting the assemblies of the church. When we come together as a church, we should strive for the unity of purpose and spirit. Uh, Alexander Campbell wrote, there can be no doubt that the Eucharist at this period, shortly after Pentecost, was preceded uniformly by a common repast as when the ordinance was instituted. Most scholars hold that this was the prevailing usage in the first centuries after Christ, and we have traces of this practice in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 20, and so, and, and so on. So uh, Campbell makes reference to the fact that the Agape Feast and the Lord's Supper were connected in the early church. What was happening at Corinth is that this common meal was being corrupted and the spirit in which they were partaking was selfish and not promoting the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Can you imagine going to a church dinner and having a group gathered in their own little circle of friends eating and drinking and not sharing anything that they had with others. You know, this would be very strange indeed, wouldn't it? Because a church meal, we come together. A lot of times we bring our meal, we spread it out, and we all enjoy together. But this is evidently what was happening at Corinth. Some of them were eating even before others arrived, and some were being filled, even to the point of drunkenness, while others had nothing. In verse 19, what does Paul mean when he says that those who are proved may be recognized among you? Uh, Kaufman offers this explanation. A glimpse of the divine mind is in, is in this. Christians who became up, uh, become upset and discouraged because of schisms, factions, and other disorders in the church make a tragic mistake. As God used Satan in the paradise of Eden to test the progenitors of the human race, he still tests the faith of all Christians. Church difficulties provide an opportunity for Christians to demonstrate that they are genuine followers of the Lord. God never intended that any man should move through life in a constant environment of encouragement and spiritual delight. There is a place in the experience of every Christian where, as we would say, the rubber meets the road. And his response to unfavorable or even tragic situations will determine whether or not he is approved of God. It should always be remembered that many are called, but few are chosen. And so Kaufman says this approval, he says... There must be factions among you. In other words, this is a means of God's testing. Uh, in verse 20, when Paul says, when you come together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Uh, some translations render this, it is not possible to eat the Lord's Supper. And that uh, tends maybe to be a little more of a commentary than a translation. But this does not mean, of course, that it was physically impossible to eat the Lord's Supper but that it was morally and maybe spiritually impossible to keep this memorial feast as a result of the abuses of the agape feast. They were in no frame of mind to observe the Lord's Supper. Those with plenty were eating without the others, and they were indulging even to the point of drunkenness. This abuse led Paul to tell them that they should eat to satisfy their physical appetites at home. Paul was not condoning drunkenness here either. He was not saying it's okay to get drunk at home. In fact, he was not saying that the only place we can eat is at home. He wasn't saying the church can't have a meal together. But rather he was saying that under these circumstances and what they needed to understand was that the Lord's Supper was not about the physical appetite. 
It's a spiritual meal. And that uh, these abuses were uh, causing them to abuse and misuse the Lord's Supper. Uh, the things they were doing showed a complete disrespect for the church. And to engage in this kind of worship atmosphere was not conducive to spiritual growth. In fact, it was just the opposite. And it was causing spiritual death. Such attitudes and conduct were leading to a corruption of the worship experience and would lead to spiritual death. Paul disapproves of this behavior and he goes on to explain then the significance of the Lord's Supper. And so we read further in verses 23 through 26 of 1 Corinthians 11. Paul said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Paul refers to the institution of the Lord's Supper on the night of the Lord's betrayal. And this memorial supper was instituted at the end of the Passover feast that Jesus and the apostles observed that night. Paul also said this is something that he received from the Lord. Uh, this is not just something that Paul had observed others doing or that others had taught him but rather this was another one of those things that Paul insisted the Lord had revealed to him because we know the Lord appeared uh, to the Apostle Paul. In verse 25, Paul says after supper that Jesus took bread. There are two cups mentioned in Luke's account of the institution of the Lord's Supper. And so Kaufman makes this comment on that. Uh, this phrase is invaluable in that it shows why two cups were mentioned, one before the bread and the other afterward in Luke 22, 17 through 20. The first cup Luke mentioned was the fourth cup of the Passover meal, which Paul here called supper, with the strongest impl implication that it was in no sense the Passover except, uh, itself except by accommodation, the same being called the cup of joy. Both the bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper were given after supper, and in that order, the bread first and the cup afterwards. So Kaufman is commenting on the fact that uh, there, the two cups that Luke mentions, one of them was the last cup of the meal they had eaten prior to the institution of the Lord's Supper. There are only two elements in the Lord's Supper, the bread, that represents his body and the cup that represents his blood. And when Paul said, as often as you eat this, he did not mean that we could eat it just any time. And it is clear from New Testament teaching and other historical documents that the Lord's Supper was observed by the early church on the first day of the week, what we would commonly call the Lord's Day. And we have no record of it being eaten at any other time. And also these same sources reveal the fact that in the early church, not long after Pentecost, uh, probably the Agape Feast was a part of that uh, assembly together on the Lord's Day as well, but it became uh, separated from it in a subsequent time. The purpose uh, for partaking is firmly established here. It is proclaimed it is to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. In uh, Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28, where Matthew records the uh, institution of the Lord's Supper, Jesus says this of the cup, For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The reference here to the new covenant by Jesus reminds us that the old covenant was nailed to the cross of Christ, and the Old Testament and its ordinances were fulfilled in Christ. And so we now have a new covenant 
in which there are better promises, as one place says in the New Testament. So Paul sets forth here what the Lord had delivered to him, he said, that in the night of his betrayal, he instituted this memorial feast. Let's read further and to the end of the chapter, verses 27 through 34. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. Paul next turns to how to partake of the Lord's Supper with the proper mind and with the, the right reasons in mind. Again, the Lord's Supper is not a common meal, and it is not for the purpose of satisfying fleshly appetites. It's not just to keep our stomachs from growling, but rather we are to eat of the Lord's Supper in a different manner. And how do we eat and drink in an unworthy manner you know Paul said whoever does this in an unworthy manner you know we dishonor the Lord's Supper when we fail to remember its significance and we do not eat it for the right purpose Paul of course is not saying that we must be sinless before we can partake not worthy in that way none of us could ever be worthy of partaking if that were the case and so he's not talking about our worthiness, but rather Paul is talking here about the manner in which we partake. We must take in a, in a godly manner, in a way that is pleasing to God. You know, this time of partaking of the Lord's Supper is a time for self-examination, a time to remember why Christ came and died. And to eat it without this knowledge makes the Lord's Supper ineffectual. When he says those eating in an unworthy manner eat and drink judgment on themselves, is Paul talking about physical things or spiritual things? What Paul says in verses 31 and 32 about being judged and chastened by the Lord that we be not condemned with the world could indicate a physical sickness and things of that nature. It's difficult to say whether physical or spiritual sickness is meant and when he refers to many that sleep, does he mean physical death or does he mean spiritual death? And whether it is physical or spiritual, the teaching is the same. We are to do it in a worthy manner, in a way that is acceptable to the Lord. Uh, Kaufman makes this comment on this question. This has usually been interpreted to mean that physical sickness and death had been visited upon the sinful Corinthians due to their shameful perversion and abuse of the Lord's Supper. And while it must be allowed that in that age of the church, God did, did send visitations of divine wrath against wrongdoers, as in the case of Ananias and Sapphira, and perhaps also in the incestuous man mentioned earlier in this epistle. Nevertheless, the conviction here is that if that had been in Paul's mind, he could hardly have said that some sleep, sleep being too mild a word to use with reference to the victims of divine wrath. The meaning which appears to be most likely is that Paul was speaking of those who had become spiritually weak and sickly, some no doubt having perished spiritually. And when Paul says in verse 29, that those eating in an unworthy manner do not discern the Lord's body, is he talking about the church or about the Lord's body itself on the cross? I believe it could refer to both since failing to remember the fact that Christ died for our sins would make the supper meaningless for us, so we must 
disown the Lord's body in that way. In fact, Jesus said, this bread is my body and this cup is the blood that I shed. So we have to discern the Lord's body. But in addition, failing to think about our brethren and how we impact them is equally harmful. And this was what was happening at Corinth. They were taking this feast that they ate and they were disabusing it. And they were abusing their brethren, not waiting on them, each one eating his own meal and not sharing with others. And so by failing to discern the impact that that was having on their own brethren, they were failing to discern the Lord's body because the church is the body of the Lord. You know, it was the, the failure or this failure to discern the spiritual body of Christ, the church, which had led to the corruption of both the Agape Feast and the Lord's Supper at Corinth, and hence Paul's need to write to them uh, to cor correct the things that had been taking place uh, there at Corinth. And again, we emphasize Paul wasn't saying that the only place we can eat is at home, and he wasn't saying that the church could not have a meal together, but he was saying that we must remember to keep the Lord's Supper for the purpose and the reason for which it was intended. And that is to remember our Lord and Savior, the sacrifice that He made for us. So uh, in conclusion, Paul concludes by saying that if you're hungry, eat at home. And as Kaufman notes, this is probably the apostolic order that resulted in the separation of the agape feast from the Lord's Supper and the eventual discontinuation of that agape feast. And so the Lord's Supper was here elevated to a position higher than that of merely satisfying physical appetites, but rather it is a spiritual feast. And so when we come together to eat the Lord's Supper, let us remember the Lord's sacrifice as we partake of the Lord's Supper and what suffering He went through on our behalf. It is a time to examine ourselves in light of what Christ has done for us. We were bought at a price. And we should remember that every Lord's Day when we partake of the Lord's Supper. The price that Jesus paid on our behalf. And when we examine self in light of this truth, I believe it makes a difference in the approach we make to life and the way that we live. And so let us examine ourselves and let us honor the Lord and also the Lord's church. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we're so thankful that you placed this feast in the kingdom, that you instituted this supper to remember your death, your burial, and your resurrection. We thank you for the bread that represents your body and the fruit of the vine, the cup that represents your blood that was shed on our behalf. And may we remember this, Father, every time we partake of this supper, the great price that you paid for us. And may we be compelled, Father, to love you and to, to want to serve you because of what you've done for us. May such, such self-examination cause us to draw closer to you. And Father, as we eat the Lord's Supper and we do it together as a congregation, let us remember that we also must discern not only the Lord's body and the fact that He gave Himself for us, but we must discern His spiritual body, that is the church, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so let us, Father, be sure that as we come together to partake that we are discerning the church, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we're doing those things that help to make for the right frame of mind when we come together to eat the Lord's Supper and to participate in this together, this great memorial feast that you have placed in your kingdom. And again, Father, we thank you for the Lord's Supper and what it means to us and what it reminds us of and the fact that through this memorial feast, we can draw closer to you and we can draw closer to one another through the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Well, we're into a, a new month. We're into the month of September now. Uh, it seems to me that we get to this time of year, things seem to go very, fairly rapidly toward the end of the year. So uh, we just pray that the Lord is blessing you, that you are healthy and well, and that you are uh, serving the Lord with all of the ways in which he has blessed you, the abilities he's given you, and the opportunities that he places before you. And we pray that you are remembering him in the supper that he himself instituted and placed in his kingdom. He put it in his kingdom as a reminder for us and he said that we should do this in remembrance of him. And so may we do that faithfully and may we receive the spiritual encouragement and nourishment that we, receive, we can receive as we meet together to eat the Lord's Supper. May God bless you until we meet again. I've been traveling here in this life with its heartache, trouble, and strife. Sometimes Satan tries to tell me to turn aside. I say, Satan, get thee behind. No returning in me you'll find. I'm too near my heavenly home where I'll abide. I'm too, I'm too near, near to home with my Lord. Lord. Too, too near, near home and heaven's, heaven's reward. And I am not returning to sin. I've made, I have my, made my vow. There's there there is nothing, nothing to go back to. Oh, praise, praise the Lord, Lord, sweet heaven's in view. I'm too, I'm too near my heavenly home to and turn, I'll not turn back now. Just one glimpse inside the home gate. See the friends and loved ones who wait. Will be worth whatever the cost to make it through. I would not give up in the race, I'll continue by the Lord's grace. I'm too near that wonderful home beyond the blue. I'm too, I'm too near to home with my Lord, too, too near to home and heaven's reward. I'm I am not returning to sin, I've made, I have my, made my vow. There's there there is nothing to go back to, oh, praise, praise the God. Lord, sweet heaven's in view. I'm too, I'm too near my heaven, my home, to and turn, I'm not turn back now. Too near heaven, I'm too near heaven to turn, I'll never turn back now.